Thank, uh, I really would like to thank David for her courage and being my American mom, taking me uh, everywhere and supporting me daily and taking care of me when I'm away from my mom and mom. She was trying to make me get bigger by eating more, but my mom, I always tell her my mom tried 23 years. And here I am still like this. She probably cannot make it in one point two months that we're going to be together. Yeah, so I'm really happy to be here and um, I really thank God for everything and, and my presence here. And, uh, yeah, and uh, also being able to tell my story. So I was born in 1994, uh, in August, a month after the genocide that took one million Tutsis in Rwanda. So uh, during the genocide, my mom was pregnant with me and she had to walk the whole way from Kigali to Congo to escape the massacres that were taking place in there. And um, my family moved to Congo to escape the massacres and when they returned to Rwanda, everything my family owned had been destroyed and our relatives had been killed during that horrid massacre. And during that time when, when people came back to the country, the country was kind of messed up without any hope, full of tears, full of blood, full of dead bodies everywhere, and dogs were putting the bodies, taking them to forest to eat to them. It was no hope really, it was like, uh, it started from zero, uh, where Many people had been killed and also the killers were drawn out of the country by RPF, uh, RPA, the army of uh, the army that were outside the country in Uganda and they came back to stop the massacres, to stop the genocide. They fought the war and they were able to stop the massacres on the 4th of July. And when they stopped the massacres on the 4th of July, they started calling everyone all the people who escaped the massacres that there were peace again and so that they could come back to their country. So that's where my family also heard on radio that everything had been settled, that there was peace again and then they came back to the country on uh, in August and I was born on 18th of August. <laughs> yeah, so when I grew up, uh, now there were of course five children. I'm uh, from a family of eight children. I am the fifth born. So at that moment I was the youngest born then. So we were like five. But afterwards we had other three children. And it was very hard for our parents who had no job to take care of the eight children and support them with the, their basic needs. So my parents not being able to give us like the basic needs, education, food, clothes. It led my brothers on the streets to scavenge for something to eat and and, um, and also sometimes they could also ask for money, like, stuff like those, or even do like really hard labor jobs to be able to earn some money by, by themselves. Uh, to take care of us who were not able to do it well, little children. So I managed to start uh, primary school and when I was in primary school I had actually two burning dreams. One was that one day I would wear a suit. Here I am wearing a suit. <laughs> and another one was that uh, I could go to one of the best schools in, in Kigali, in Rwanda. Both the dreams were not possible at the moment because one, my family which could not afford clothes and food for me, of course could not afford money to buy the suit. And the second, this school was a school that hosted children from a rich family, from a wealthy family or high ranked officers in Chicago. So a child like me who was born in a poor family, it was really hard for anyone to imagine that I could go to that school. So Every time I told people, as even my, my siblings, that I wanted to go to that school, they thought it wasn't possible. They were like, Beltrand, you are 
over Amy, you know, you cannot make it there. But I talked to uh, one person and he was like, if you work hard and you achieve the best grades in school, you might be able to go to that school. So that's what gave me hope and I kept uh, working towards the, the goal. So when I was done with primary school, we did the national examination of the end of primary school and I, I, got, I was the seventh out of 256 children, which was pretty good. Yeah. And they, because after you do the national examination, they sent you to schools according to your performance and those who did like really great, they would be sent to really prestigious schools in Kigali, like that according to your performance. So I was sent to a really good school called the Fatek in Kigali, but I was not able to go to that school because my family could not afford paying the school fees. The school fees there was like 50,000 Roman francs, which is like $60 here per term, uh, $180 per year for the whole year. But my family could not afford that, so I dropped out of the school for the whole year. And then uh, when I dropped out the school, my dad kept chicken, so he was probably, uh, it was like, okay, now I have someone to take care of my chicken. Mm -hmm. yeah, and he was like, you, uh, you have to uh, take care of my chicken and go get chicken feed every night from the restaurants. I did that, and every night I would go get the food for the chicken and take really good care of them. But this one day, it was almost the beginning of the next academic year and I was afraid that that year I wouldn't also go out school and that I was probably going to drop out permanently. So I went up to dad and I was like, dad, I'm really tired of this. I can keep fetching food for the chicken and not going to school. How is my future going to look like if I don't study, if I don't uh, go at school? Because education at this time is is actually uh, the most important thing in everybody's life. If you're not educated, if you don't have a degree, it's hard to get a good job and it's hard to uh, achieve your dreams, achieve your goals. So that was like, that my dad didn't have any money, but he was like a very good believer. He prayed really hard for God's help. And um, I went up to him and I was like, Dad, I really can't uh, keep on with this. Other children are going to school. This is the whole year I haven't been at school and this is the beginning of the next academic year. I don't see any hope that I'm going to school, so I can't do this anymore. And my dad was like, Bertrand, don't worry, God is going to make a way, you're going to go back at school again. Something I couldn't get as a, a little kid. But I knew he didn't have any money, so that's why I decided not to stress him out and I left. And this, uh, I kept on going to get food for the chicken, just like I did normally. And there was this small child that my mom had adopted from a truck and take him home and we were always hanging out and I always asked him to go with me get food for the chicken. So this one day, when we were on our way back, it was like three weeks before another academic year begins, we came from uh, the restaurant and then I saw this tall British man coming to me. He came and he asked me like, what do you have in the bag? It was like, food for the chicken. And he was like, did you eat? It was around 7.30. And I was like, now that he's asking me if I ate, he probably wants to give me something. <laughs> and I was like, no, I didn't eat. And he was like, why did you buy the food for the chicken, but not your own food? And he was like, I didn't buy it. I got it for free from the restaurant. And he was like, okay give the boy uh, the bag and follow me. I gave the boy the bag and followed him and I went to his house, which was not far, like 10 minutes walking. And then he went in and he came back, he gave me two bananas and 2,000 bananas francs. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I went home and then I gave one, the boy one banana and I ate one and I went home and then I gave money to mom and I told my family what happened. And my mom started saying, oh, maybe this is God's way. He's probably going to sponsor you and take you back at school. And I was like, mom, I barely know him. You know, this is overreacting. 
And uh, this one day, we all, after a few days, we met again, and he bought me two soccer balls, two new soccer balls. I played one and we sold one to be able to buy food uh, at home. And um, after another uh, like two days, I went back. I well, I went to play soccer, and then afterwards, because I knew my responsibility to go get food for the weekend, I ran to the restaurant to get food with my friends that were playing soccer with. And when I came back, he came and touched my hair. And when I looked up, it was the British. Man. We started talking about my life. We started talking about my education. And he was like, uh, what about sending you back at school? And I was like, hey, yeah, that's what I wanted. And he was like, but I have to see your family first. And he told me that to come at his house the next morning. When I went to his house, he was already doing calculations about my school fees, my notebooks, my everything. And he paid my school fees and sent me back at school. But he gave me this condition. He was like, if you ever get over the 10th in class, that's the ranking system in Rwanda, I will stop paying your school fees. So I had to work hard to maintain the favor. And I was as the results with prayers, I was always the best in, in, in my school with more than 80% of performance. So he was really proud of me and he asked my parents if I could live with him and visit uh, really often. I did that. He taught me a lot of things. He taught me English. He taught me uh, many uh, values that I needed about life, about selflessness and many other things. And he took me to hotels. He took me to restaurants something I had never had before. He bought me really good clothes. He bought me all the materials I needed for my school. And when, when um, I was in senior three, he got married to a this girl and he bought me my very first suit. <laughs> so my, <laughs> so my, dream, my first dream came true. I wore my very first suit at that time. And then when, when I was done with the second uh, senior three, we had to sit for the national examination again. And I wanted to be the best in Rwanda, but I got sick in the two last exams and I was the best in Kasau district. That's like Missouri State. And they sent me to one of the top three best schools in Rwanda, but not the school of my dream. So I went to that school for one month and I lost contact with Doug. He went to work in Uganda and then he went to Zambia and we couldn't keep in touch. So everything that had happened before was just an introduction of what was going to happen to me next. It had been really hard. We didn't have en enough food. We didn't have clothes. We were barely uh, almost naked and bare food. But this time, it, that time it was bearable because of all the support from Doug and other people. But this time that we lost contact, it was like the introduction of what was going to happen next. After one month, I moved from that school to the school of my dream because I thought that if I don't go to the school of my dream when I'm still in high school, I was never going to go there. So that's why I said after one month, I said goodbye to everyone and I went to that school. And when I got to that school, the headmaster, when he saw me and my mom, he was like, hey, you have to go back because you can't be admitted to this school. One, it was too late. Second, it was too hard to go to that school when you were a person of my status. So my mom was already angry with me because I took a decision to go from the other school to that school without telling her. And she had to take a risk to go help me ask an admission to the other school. So she left, and, but I, I went behind a little bit longer and the headmaster was like, how much did you achieve in your national examination? Because I knew I was the best in the Southern district. I handed him the paper proudly and when he saw it, he was like, oh, you can tell your mom to come back. We can help and see how we give you admission to the school. And I ended up in the school of my dream. Oh. Yeah. Um, 
And after I got there, I didn't know like God's will to be able to take me to this school till on my way home when I would um, always walk miles to get to this school. I was always suspended out of that school because my family could not pay my school fees and I had lost contact with Dad. And I could sometimes eat once every day at night because the school could not give me food because I hadn't paid for meal card. The card which would allow me to eat. And every time when other children would go to eat into the dining room, I would go to the library and bring a book and read book and they would be like, oh, this boy is too ready to go to eat. He likes books more than food. But I knew why I would do that. I wanted to be busy so I forget about hunger and all that. And I would always work from school despite the hunger miles back at home. And I started getting chased out of school really many times. And I started thinking that it wouldn't work unless I worked to pay my school fees. I started going to work cleaning wealth people's houses to earn some money for paying my education. And I started having enough time to go to arts galleries to improve my artistic capacity. So I worked in arts and, and then as time went on, I started getting more successful in arts. Paid, uh, earning more money in arts and more than actually enough that I needed at the moment. I could pay my school fees, I could support my family, and I would always pass on the street and see children on the street begging for money and food just like we had passed through in the same life circumstance. So I was like, now Doug uh, gave up a lot of things to be able to send me on school. I was like, what about me giving up a lot uh, as well to be able to send those kids at school? So I sent the three first children at school, and that time I had, uh, uh, I met this Spanish girl called Azahara. She was doing research in Rwanda and she befriended me. We became like really good friends. And I would always tell her about my vision, what I did, what I had already started with those kids, and my vision that I wanted to support more people. And she was like, that is a great idea. I will support you. When I helped her in her research, organizing everything, and as she was there the first time, she was kind of uh, confused with the systems, I helped her out. And when she went back home, she told her parents about me, about my vision, about um, the way I helped her. And their parents, well, uh, uh, they felt like supporting the idea. So they supported and we sent like nine children at school in the first round. And then uh, I also went to my school, that school of my dream, uh, which was like children from wealthy families. And, those children were pretty good occupiers, and I was like, um, we held meetings and we agreed upon making contributions so that we can send children, more children to school. So I involved those children in my school, and Azahara and her friends and other friends I was making through arts. Um, just like I met them through arts. They all supported and got involved and we were able to send 49 children at school at the moment. And I was like, now that we have sent more children at school, what about making an organization to be able to send more kids at school or create more projects to support their parents? And that's how we started the Rainbow Foundation as an organization in 2015 with the name of Breaking the Circle of Poverty that originated from the genocide and enabling, like bringing a new enlightenment in this new generation of ours. So, um, after, uh, after creating the organization, we started uh, also Mama Rwanda Project, which is a project that puts together vulnerable single mothers and creates projects for them that empowers them to be able to support their families. So we got 25 single mothers in the program and they finished their training this year in airport. That's where they got certificate of completion of their training. They now, after getting the certificate, the two of them got the job in one in the greatest 
industry, like fashion industry in Rwanda. So their life changed completely. And that's what we want, that's what we're seeking. So now we're supporting 82 children and those 25 single mothers and that wouldn't be possible if not gone through people who got involved through us, through um, uh, David that I met uh, last year and many people who are willing to support for the same cause to make this keep running. So the organization doesn't have like this source of income that we can rely on. It relies on my art, 65%, and then sponsorship uh, from people who are willing to help take kids at school, and contribution. Because you might not be able to afford $75 or 100 or 200 but whatever uh, you can afford can help put more children at school. Uh, if it's put together, uh, it can also help. Our, our slogan says, make a move, shake the world. Which means every move you make is as important as my move, who is always there. We, we, no one is, uh, uh, is more uh, contributing, like who can say, oh, this one is the one who is contributing the best. Because if you're doing anything, uh, if you're doing the best you can, and I am doing the best I can, that's all that matters. And I believe that I am a citizen of the world. I believe in the life of a person who is in Burundi matters as much as the life of a person who is in Rwanda or elsewhere. And I believe I was created to make the world a better place. And <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I believe that if we put more efforts together, we can make a change that is needed in Rwanda, in those children's life, and elsewhere where things are not, um, where we are called uh, to participate in making a development needed or a change in a person, person's life that is needed. So that is how I, I have been able to use art to make a change and to create uh, a better society in my country and to help. Because I believe as young people, we don't want to, and that's what our government encourages us to, to be. It encourages us to be better, a better generation. And we have a chance that now we want our peace. So it is now our time to work as much as possible to bring now what is needed, to bring a change that is needed um, through everything that a person can do. So I have uh, a painting here that I would like to talk about, but I, would, I was wondering if any of you have a question to ask uh, about what I have just said so far, or an opinion, or an idea, or anything you feel like telling. Where did you learn your uh, art? Did you go to a school, a Never. special school for that, or did you just come by that naturally? Well, when I was young, I, I, would, I was pretty good at sketching, and I didn't go to any art school, hmm. so it's God-given gift. Wow. And probably what I did was to learn more through other artists, just like I still do. I am not uh, a professor in art or whatever, so I'm still learning. As I look at the painting, I learn. So that's the way it came out and it developed. Yeah. Okay. Do you teach everything? Mm -hmm. And you're on the. Do you teach your art and and um, you teach the children everything? Yeah, that's right. I teach. Uh, I think you saw some pictures of the kids uh, drawing. Yeah, we we try to stimulate that uh, gift also in those who have it and they don't know. And there is this thing that, that is amazing in people. Like people have capacity to do everything, but they can't do that till they figure out that they really do. Because 
And when a child is still young, they can sing, they can be athletics, they can do art, they can be whatever they want to be. But they can't if they don't figure out that they can make it. So it takes older people to go down to him and see what they really are passionate in and put more effort in that. And I don't believe in art being a uh, academic thing, which is good, but then you end up because in, there is not a class of one person. Well, there there is uh, sometimes, but most of the times we learn as a class of many people. So if you learn the same technique, you end up also making the same thing, and that's how art. I don't think that's how art should be. Art should be through creativity. You create something new. And therefore, the best way to learn art would be maybe interacting with other artists and also coming up uh, with your own ideas and developing it from there. And yeah, that's, that's what I think. I don't know if I answered your question pretty well, but yeah. So, so how is your family with the, the, other, the other children? Oh, the other children are very good. Uh, like the three of them, the two of them graduated university yeah and my little brother is studying here in the u.s in college wow. yeah in st louis and my uh you're in st louis you said? yeah you're in st right. louis what, what school i don't know the school very well but oh, okay. yeah but he's uh doing biology in college and um others got married they have their own families <laughs> The elephant. But I don't think any of you saw a colorful elephant in a park <laughs> <laughs> or a zoo. Maybe if you met it, you would run, you would think maybe something is wrong. Yeah, so first of all, the elephants, just like dogs, are really good friends of humans. Um, somewhere in Thailand, they, they, uh, some people keep elephants and they are really good friends. And, and elephants, they never forget their place, their homeland, where they belong. Wherever you take them, they would strive to uh, uh, try to go back. So it's an elephant, and the colors and the idea actually reflects the society, a society of people who were uh, denied. Uh, their own country, their own land, and they loved their country. They wanted to be back in their homeland. And this one day, they decided to go back to their homeland. So it's an elephant titled "Go uh, Back to Homeland Elephant." So that's the idea in this uh, elephant. And those people were actually. It goes back to the history of Rwanda. In 1959, they, they tried to kill Tutsi the first time, and they were, it was 1959. Uh, that was like killings. They burnt houses of Tutsis. They killed cows. They, they, uh, it was uh, a really, uh, a really tragic thing too. And. A lot of families fled to neighboring countries. They moved to Congo, to Tanzania, to Burundi, to Uganda to escape that aggression. And uh, some of those people grew up in exile. They went when they were like three years old or two years old. Or maybe others were born outside their country. They only heard about their country as a story. And they felt this kind of uh, I don't know how to call this, but they, they, they were willing to go back to their country. And this is why in 1990 they tried, that they, uh, they created an armed group uh, and a political party so that they could, if, it, if they wouldn't be allowed in their country, they could possibly fight to go back to their country. Yes. Can you talk about your other painting? This? Can you talk about 
talk about that to us? This painting? Yes. Yeah, this uh, this one is called is called Mama Rwanda, and it shows African uh, Christian. You can see, yeah, and it it, it reflects uh, African outfit and uh, the way the mothers carry their children. I saw here mothers carry their children in front, but for us they go at the back and. They have a scarf around or a piece of cloth around here. And it reflects like how hard working mothers are and their love to the children. You see they are carrying pots of water and baskets. So mothers are I heard her hips just disconnected. It's it's a style. It's like I don't want because I didn't want to add like all the details, so I wanted like semi realism. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Mothers are pretty special people. I mean, they are really special people. Yeah, so this group of people then decided to come back to their homeland uh, in 1990. And in 1994, there was the genocide, and they are the ones who stopped the, the massacres. and liberated the country. So that is the story behind this. It's in this special animal called elephant because of its love, of its home. But I also do this the same style in people in uh, yeah in people people back to homeland and uh, other elephants. Do you paint mainly in acrylic? Acrylic, oil, but I don't like using oil often because it takes time to dry and it's also hard to add details. Uh, Where do all your colors come from? The colors of your paintings are just astounding. Where, where does that come from in your life or how does it? Well, the, the environment also inspires people. When I went to Mexico last year, their paintings are pretty different. They are different. They are really, they are quite they are silent, if I could say that. They are not that vibrant and uh, many bright colors because of their environment is also like that. You know, all the if you even when you look at your paintings there, it reflects. Looking at them, you could directly tell that they are made in America or these developed countries uh, because they reflect your environment. So here also the paintings also reflect our environment as, as well. It's a very cheerful environment, very bright, people dressed in bright color and stuff. So you would like it, you should come and visit Rwanda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You said you walked to school and then walked home. How yeah. hard did you have to walk? I don't know that in miles. But it could be like how many kilometers was it? Uh, more than eight kilometers. Wow. What's that? Be about five miles. Oh no, it's not eight. I don't know specifically, but it was pretty far. It's like uh, walking. How long is from St. Louis to Wentzville? Oh, that's about forty-two miles. That's pretty long. It could be. Uh, like 30 miles. Yeah, it was a pretty long trip, like really long. That I have to wake up really early and walk the whole, uh, and I could sometimes reach at school, walk for maybe three, four hours, and running. Before you go home in Maine? 
Well, I'm going to see her on 23rd. What? 23rd. It's Sunday. Oh, you're going on Sunday? Yeah. Oh, great. He hasn't seen her for two years. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. I haven't seen her for She's two She's still years. your girlfriend? Of course, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she will. think so? You think so? No, no, she is. Definitely. She is. <laughs> <laughs> I would feel very bad being here if she was <laughs> Just joking. So is she a teacher? Huh? Is she a teacher in the school? No, she's not a teacher. She still goes at school. We went to the same school. To the school of my dream. That's where we went. Oh, and the Bertrand does not run a school. He sends oh, yeah. them to the public schools. Yeah. Um, and he has a Saturday where they all come to his foundation. And then his mother's, for that Mama Rwanda project, they work throughout the week. Okay. So, um, yeah, he supports them to go to the public schools. No. Which I didn't understand that either. I thought he started his own school. Oh, no. I want he to. He pays their fees and their supplies and their health insurance. I, wow. Yeah. And for some families, he pays their rent. He can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's really hard to say no when you see. Does she have a uh, relationship? There is a seven. Yes. Uh, so when you sell your artwork, what would you sell a piece like that? This? This, this one is 600. That's all? <laughs> That's all. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> and, and you know, he's having trouble selling in the United States. Um, to, to buy a piece of artwork is a very personal thing. People really have to think about it. And he's he brought over 17 paintings all rolled up. Mm -hmm. And so we made stretchers, mm -hmm. and he stretched them, and they're in two galleries now. Uh, but he really hasn't had a lot of success with the bigger ones. People like the smaller ones. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, like he said, it's an environmental thing. Mm -hmm. And they're definitely an African painting. Mm -hmm. but he did this one for me today. Do you want to hold that one up or can Today? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I like that. Nice. I do too. Yeah. <laughs> this one is a hat. You know this house made out of graces? Uh, Rwanda had this kind of houses through a uh, long time ago, up to like 2003. That's when Rwanda started developing pretty fast and they started building uh, real better houses and improving the infrastructure. But those are the kind of houses we, we hired. And here you see a woman going from home and she's pregnant and she holds uh, a lot of stuff here and carries uh, a pot on the head, going to fetch water and then go shopping. And so it's, it's much work, it reflects how strong women are. I saw that from my mom. My mom is a very strong woman, taking care of all of us and children mm -hmm. and making sure. My mom went at my school a few times. There are two ways a mom goes at school. One, when a child misbehaves. Mm -hmm. Two, when a child is doing great. <laughs> <laughs> so she came to my to my school. She was really proud of me. Sometimes she would say, my friend, I'm sorry I don't have something to give you. But know that I appreciate what you, you do. Because they would tell me, we want to see your mom, to see what the kind of mom gave birth to a boy like you. <laughs> I, was, I liked that too, because I, I would be more disappointed if my mom came at school because I misbehaved of them and yeah. did bad things. Mothers, I respect that. How old is your mother? She's 49. 49? What is the price of the painting you just said? 30. 30? Yeah. Sold. Sold. <laughs> yes. This one is sold. <laughs> we love you guys. <laughs> you know I want it. Sorry. <laughs> and this one. <laughs> and this one. Oh, I hope, I hope funders don't punch me tonight <laughs> for this. But this one shows. Um, well, in, I don't know if it was the same thing here, but in Rwanda, uh, it was uh, like some of domestic works, taking care of the children and doing that a lot of uh, 
much work that well, most of the times unrecognized by men or anyone else was done by women. But it changed. Now the government empowered women. We have more than 60% of women in parliament. And this tells us that actually the work that women do, there is nowhere it's written that a man cannot do it. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> men can clean, we can oh. take care of children. <laughs> I hope men yeah, don't touch me tonight. <laughs> yeah, 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 you can see a man now. Uh, he's carrying a baby at the back and he has a lot of stuff for sale and he's carrying a big basket, just like this woman was done. They are human too, they need to rest and we can do some stuff <laughs> as well, you know. So, it shows equality uh, of women. And I, I think uh, a family runs better and more prosperous if men and women work together and they... Of course there are some specific responsibilities for particularly men and for particularly women. But there are other, a lot of things that women do and the men would say, oh, I can't do that, it's for women. And it can be a shared responsibility and the family can run pretty good. Well, the men so, could help the women if the women would help chase chickens. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And then I would say, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's still, still trying to work things. Huh? <laughs> Some American men are still trying to work things. <laughs> In the world now, <laughs> there is equality between men and women, so it's it's pretty good now. So I I made this just in case to remind some men. <laughs> what a nice piece! Thank you. I would say like two things about that. One, one, it is always hard for. Uh, people to get through that kind of situation and be in peace again. That's why Rwanda stands like a very good example in the rest of the world. Because peace and reconciliation and forgiveness <coughs> has been achieved in Rwanda where everyone saw that it would not be possible. It was possible and it is a living example when you go to Rwanda. A very peaceful country, a very developing country, very beautiful country. Uh, so a very secret, green country. What's the secret to bringing peace between The secret? After, after, after one side slaughtered 100,000 people, I mean, how do you, what's that secret? Well, it would, it would be hard to speak on behalf of other people because I don't know their secret on their behalf. Mm -hmm. But on my family's behalf, it's all about <coughs> forgiving and wanting peace uh, where uh, war or uh, whatever conflict would be also a choice. But you choose to, you choose peace and reconciliation and love and forgiveness instead. And that, that's where peace comes from. It comes from forgiveness and it's part of tolerance. Faith. Mm -hmm. faith and God's, God's help, you know. If you pray and uh, if you pray hard, God will give you strength forgive and get over stuff that are really hard to let go of That had to be a conscious choice because to really truly forgive is so such a Yeah, it's always, it's always a choice, you know, a choice of people. A choice of people. If something like that happens, it's up to you to choose either to forgive or not to. But we chose to forgive and develop our country and work hard and, and we looked into future and into a hope ahead than 
the past. We learn from the past and keep going ahead and make sure that what happened never happens again. So that's what this post uh, genocide generation like me and other a lot back home are striving for. First of all, to learn about the past, our history, and second, to make sure that it never happens again, and third, to participate in development and building our country back, because it was totally ruined. Will you be going back? Yeah. Are you? What was the inspiration behind that piece? This also has like African style content, but it's called dancing. That's how you can dance. Dancing. 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 That's what I say. You say kaya, you see, it's for dancing. Yeah. Rana traditional dance is pretty good, it's very good. Uh, yeah, we could look that up on, on YouTube. It's really nice. So, this is called dancing. And How much is that one? This is 150. 150? What is shaped? about right. Huh? Oh, yeah. You want this? One final thought for them to go home with. The one wow. thing you really want to convey tonight to them would be. That's okay, that's, pretty that's a pretty tough question yeah. because <laughs> I would. Uh, what you say? I can't. Uh, well, I don't like specifically in which field, but if uh, there is this one thing I would say, it's. I would say, the advice would be figuring out God's calling on your life and doing it with all your efforts. Mm -hmm. And always doing the best you can to make the world a better place. That's all. Focused in North St. Louis County, Northside Art Association is a nonprofit 501c3 arts organization that serves local artists through community exposure, networking, education, and peer interaction. Learn more about Northside Art Association at www.northsideartassociation.org.